performative props, performative objects, and I think this is like something like a clipboard, you know, is also a, such a performative prop. You know, it's a clipboard is a great prop because when you hold it, it always looks like you know, <laughs> think yourself here. You know, Some of you might know that doing this is such a PhD or any other project, long term project, is an unsettling process in itself. And some months ago, I, I became sick for a rather long time and I had to stay home. And although I, I should have done all this work for also for the exhibition here and everything, so I was labor and fever and stuff. And then one night, uh, I this uh, three terms uh, showed up in my mind. Three figures or concepts that have been very influential both in science fiction and also in actual space exploration. And they somehow they also represent different levels of unsettlement. The, the thing with, 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 with the unsettled, with unsettling thing, uh, with the term unsettlement, which I also find interesting, is you know, perhaps you know that this, it's very hard to, this, to translate the German word of unheimlich. English and normally it's uncanny the translation and unheimlich literally in German means unhomely so I think uh, unsettled is quite a much better translation and in terms of my project if, if you think about Earth as our home I think space might be the most unhomely we can think yeah so uh, I'm going to show you some pictures it's the astronaut the robot Alien, the astronaut, the robot, the alien, the cosmonaut, the robot, the alien, another cosmonaut, the Austrian astronaut.
the apocal apocalypse, even if it came, it's not actually the end. And that there is always an aftermath. And whatever happens in this aftermath, you know, I see it as what you guys were discussing in a, in a sense also. And uh, I was also thinking about this in between areas or zones, like the zone actually. And one of, one of my references in these zones is a work by a sci-fi author, I don't know if you know him, Samuel R. Delaney. Uh, he wrote a, he published a book just one year before we were born, in 1975. It's called Dahlgren. And it became, in the era of Nixon and so on, a kind of nowhere, where all of these previous 60s visions or the even the cosmic ideals maybe took some sort of refuge or disappeared because and it's, a, it's an area that doesn't have no name. So it's in a city that is basically without a, without a name, a nameless city. And uh, I just want, wanted to, to talk about this kind of blindness or I don't know, like whatever happened like that. So I don't know. I don't know, one, uh, one thing that's for sure that uh, what ended is, uh, and uh, is, um, well, I guess this um, belief that uh, the imagination is uh, infinite <laughs> and that uh, there's, um, uh, you know, sort of, sort of sheer imagination of uh, uh, going through the, um, then, uh, the history outward, uh, also, you know, the reality will change. So, what, when you talking about the song, I think that uh, what stayed with us after this apocalyptic end of the space age, uh, one of the things that stay with us are the closed spaces, because all uh, what stay, what remained, what sedimented from the space age. Uh, very powerfully, are the myriad of very closed and uncomfortable and problematic spaces. Think, for instance, of uh, Ojika's Out of the Present, you know, the astronaut showed in all its inglorious uh, discomfort, uh, then this place, then uh, the, all these enclosed interiors, I think that's, um, and the feeling, um, I guess, uh, I don't know, maybe J.J. Ballard put it uh, uh, very clearly when you know, he was talking about uh, the fantasy of uh, uh, space conquest actually being uh, an infinite series of greyhound buses uh, or corridor or office corridors. Um, so I think uh, we have this, uh, this uh, heritage of the infinite uh, rep the reproduction of enclosed closed uh, uh, spaces of, that bring and maybe safety but a lot of discomfort and in which then our imagination and our hope is kind of uh, uh, like a seed, I guess. Yeah, I'm, are they so uncomfortable, the closed spaces? I mean, if you think about uh, shopping malls, they kind of the the paradigm. Yeah. So, but I mean, I, I also think like this whole, you know, the, the climate control room and the environmental control are a big legacy and in terms of yeah, controlled ecology, ecology in a way. Mm. But what I also, I mean, that's a, also another point maybe, what I found interesting is this kind of different ruins because like in the first film, the, I mean, or 
to generalize it. Post-socialist ruins are quite obvious visually there as representations, whereas I think also kind of in the states, or I mean, there's a lot of, uh, of ruins that are not so obvious. It's it's the same, not the same, but it's also all these ruins around. And I, that's something I was always attracted to. This huge, like I mean, it's just from the early nineties, Biosphere Two, and if you go there, it's just such a sad ruin. It's like all, already a monument, like a pyramid monument in a way. Even though there are still tourists and it's still experiments there, but it's it, it is a ruin. In What is the what is the relation to the ruin in the closed space? Yeah, I guess it, it uh, it's a closed space and it's not closed anymore. It's kind of like a, a, you know, a place, a formally closed place that starts being in a world that begin, right? Uh, and that's very interesting what you say about the ruins of uh, uh, socialism being very visible um, because. Um, yeah, if you have, um, they may be visible, but they created a lot of uh, forgetting, right? And so when uh, we, re we begin to reapproach them, we, I think we do have to approach them with care and a bit of caution, and uh, uh, because there's. Um, The, these uh, ruins, uh, 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 well, are embodiments of uh, historical, different historical times that uh, have either exploded or uh, keep on uh, evolving to unknown ends. And when we say that the ruins of, East, of uh, Eastern Europe, let's say, let's say industrial ruins, are more visible, maybe. What I'm thinking immediately is also that the, uh, let's say the status of the image maybe was different under the <coughs> existing socialism in a sense that um, well the image itself was not as much a, a something uh, belonging to I don't know. Uh, representation, to a system of representation that was part of reality, like with the slogans or uh, with uh, certain iconic uh, images of figures, of faces. Um, and so the status of the image uh, was uh, in a way, um, uh, the image, let's say, I would, I would propose was uh, uh, part of reality as much as the living beings in the world, right? And <laughs> so let's put it this way. And so once uh, the whole paradigm change uh, happened in 89-92, then uh, those uh, images, those shapes of that world have actually become this visible uh, uh, more visible precisely because they had another superior ontological uh, um, status before in mind. Not as simple images caught in a, a practice of capture or a technological capture, but parts of reality. Right. Sorry, I just came with this and I want to talk to you actually. Because uh, the last talk I ever had, I was not going to talk in this kind of setting. So I was in a black box uh, of carton, like, uh, you know, with a hole, and I was speaking through this hole. Uh, but uh, yet I decided to come and uh, be with you guys and talk with you. And uh, this is one, uh, one example why I came. Uh, it's a book, it's the last book apparently written, co-written by Gagarin and was uh, translated in Romanian in 1971, I think. Uh, and it's called Psychology and the Cosmos. This 
book starts with a very enclosed space. But this enclosed space is before civilization. Actually, it is a cavern. And it is a cavern during the Ice Ages. Uh, it basically jumps and relates to the space of the, ca of the cabin of the cosmonaut uh, going to the moment when humanity basically had to take refuge in these very enclosed spaces and to be uh, in a situation which is actually similar to most of what cosmos is. Uh, exposed to this kind of uh, elements and exposed to the, the forces that are uncontrollable. And inside this kind of cavern, there existed a habitat, basically. A microclimate. And this they take as being the first biosphere, uh, and, and in a sense, and that inspired the, the, the way that is uninterrupted in their vision to the to the to the reaching for the stars basically, but uh, yeah, th this was the yeah the, the, the reference they bring in. So uh, yeah, but I'm I'm also thinking about this kind of uh, the, the critique about uh, uh, communism in one country, right, as a sort of enclosure that that. Communists had to suffer in a sense that it, it, it was under this kind of, like a, as, a, as, a, as a considered, you know, like a, as a contagion that had to be contained. And uh, in a sense, even this vision of coldness, of, you know, all these spy uh, books that were written uh, in the, like the most famous, maybe being this, uh, the spy that came from the cold. Which is this image of the East as a sort of outer space, in a sense, right? So, and the, the first thing when you really told about this story from the book that came to my mind is, is in, in Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy, there's a faction of the astronauts who go to Mars, like they go 100, I think. People and the affection of them uh, goes, how do you say that, uh, goes off course and they disappear. So, like, you know, maybe I know this story from the, uh, from the uh, Americas about the lost colony. Mm -hmm. the, the first settlers in Northern America were a lost colony because they just said, fuck this colonization, we just gonna live our lives there. And what the people on Mars do is like this, this 20, 30 people, they also go to the South Pole and build a cave in the ice, again, where they have basically a tropical climate inside there, the huge ice cave. So, I never thought about the ice cave as such. But it takes a time to, it takes a little bit of time, I mean, it's really interesting that they went uh, uh, as far back as the, 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 you know, the ice age, and they found even in the Ice Age, they found an enclosed space. I mean, they found the apartment in the Ice Age. That's what they found. Uh, and, uh, but it takes time to, to and, uh, inhabit different uh, enclosed places to understand the historicity of this uh, um, and the limits of this Im imaginary. And um, for instance, you know, the, the, one of the examples that I kept on thinking when, um, uh, is uh, of <coughs> this fantasy or of this imaginary of the, of the self-sufficient biosphere that actually has a finite life course is, you know, those uh, 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 glass balls with little crustaceans that were sold, right? You know, <laughs> so uh, the finitude of the life of that uh, thing which initially right, uh, sold uh, uh, well, the potential infinite uh, self-sufficient right uh, um, little, um, system. So the finitude of that thing took right the passing of different historical times, right? Uh, <laughs> the consciousness of the 80s, the consciousness of the 90s, the consciousness of the 2000s, 
that developed uh, until uh, you asked the question, what happened with those balls, glass balls? Um, and so, right. Um, and they were actually a gimmick, uh, a gadget. These uh, so-called <coughs> sea monkeys, they were called these crustaceans. Your shrimp? Uh, the shrimp, the this, shrimp. This shrimp. And you could order them by post, uh, starting in the 50s. And, uh, in the 50s? In the 50s, yeah. yeah. And it was this kind of novelty uh, kind of product that, that somehow made it everywhere. And the, the idea is that these actual crustaceans can survive because they survive desertification. So when the water dries out, even in uh, sea, sea lakes, uh, uh, salt lakes, they manage their eggs, manage to survive inside to, uh, you know, make it over the bad season and then to, yeah. But this was, again, you know, <laughs> and you could say, I mean, you could say it was subsumed inside the capitalist system in a sense that they were very easily transported and sent mm -hmm. from one uh, consumer to the other. But anyway, it also it also allowed them to become very very uh, dispersed. This is the the the, oh, okay. the, the final uh, the final thing. Uh, you know, I mean, okay, I'm sure many of you know this because it's connected also to the take of your of this. Um, sanatorium. Actually, they are producing the black stuff that you put on the skin. It's the excrement. So, it's the same kind of organism. Okay. Well, and this reminds me also of uh, there's this Romanian science fiction novel, uh, I think, written before we three were born, <laughs> uh, 72 or 73, something like that. And uh, it ends. I think the name is Doando, maybe, yeah, Doando, Doando. And uh, it ends with uh, um, this uh, dream of, um, uh, yeah, space conquest, but imagine this way, there's, uh, uh, I don't know how many huge ships, which are so big that inside them are actually are planets. And so they, they basically shield off the planets from one uh, solar system, you know, which is dying <laughs> to uh, another galaxy and so a uh, solar system where, you know, they will be... Uh, so basically, of course, the material reality of that, imagine, imagine it's, uh, it's the, I guess, the glass, the same enclosed uh, space, yeah. The, 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 the lot died, uh, but a lot also survived, at least until uh, as long as the original thing remained. That's one thing that kept connected to this. Now, William Boros uh, suggested they put another species of primates in there. Mm -hmm. And that, I forgot the name, but there's a very small species of primate monkey. Okay. Okay. And uh, so they put that in. But unfortunately, I think it was a pair of, of them. And they but they got caught in some machine in the, in the basement. Oh, oh. So, but it's it's a bit like uh, it's it's this this mythology also from the biosphere, a bit like Nagagarit's tree. It's William Burroughs' primates in the biosphere. <laughs> so it's like what happened. So, so, uh,